Yeah, so my name is Jim Ward. I'm in a band called Sparta, and we're returning to your wonderful country in May 2024 and cannot wait. Beautiful, Jim. Thanks for joining us today, brother. Thanks for having me. No worries. So as you say, Sparta will hit Australia in May 2024 for a series of shows starting in Brisbane on May the 16th before moving through Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide and finishing in Perth on May the 23rd. Like, How long has it actually been since the last time you were out here, mate? It's been a while. Yeah, it'll be about 12 years by the time I get there. Wow. Too, too long, for sure. Right, well, this is going to be a bit of a loaded question then, mate. So, what, what's actually changed with the band since last time you were out here? Uh, members for sure. There's, <laughs> it's a, we're, so we play as a three piece now. It's still, it's still Matt Miller on bass, but we have sort of a, uh, rotating cast of drummers depending on the tour. So really the only two band members are, are Matt and I. So we make the records, we sort of have other friends play drums on stuff. Um, and then we tour with, you know, whoever, usually it's this guy named Neil Hennessy that plays in Lawrence Arms and Joyce Manor. Uh, he's been doing most of it. So, but yeah, it's, uh, other than that, you know, we we just have aged gracefully and just are better looking than ever. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to be playing your debut album, Why Chap Scars, to celebrate 20 years since it was released in 20, 2002? Like, is this going to be your first time playing that whole album, mate, or are you doing a few shows overseas first? So we we just finished uh, 61 shows of this tour. So we did the, we did North America and Europe. Um, and then Australia is actually the end of the tour. Um, yeah. And my rule was we can call it a 20th year celebration if it falls within 20 years of that tour, right? So that tour, was 18, <laughs> cool. that tour was 18 months long. So this is just kind of, you know, it's 20, 20 ish, I like to say. <laughs> Isn't ish one of the most wonderful words in the language? <laughs> It's perfect for me. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so when you first started playing this album, mate, like when you sat down to learn it, to play it live, like was there any difficulties in actually being able to structure it? Like when you, when you made the album, I can't imagine you would have one day thought that you're going to have to play the whole thing. No. And, and you know, we, we made this, and I sort of have this philosophy when I make records that I'm going to make a record that's going to last. It's going to be that record forever. And that's great. But I don't necessarily want to make that record on stage every night. I want to... I want that. I want the music to be able to evolve, and you know, within the confines of still being the same songs, it's not like they're, you know, it's not jazz versions of anything or anything like that. But it is. Um, I don't care too much about recreating it perfectly. But we did when the record came out. We did tours of five piece so that all the stuff that I was doing on keyboards, we had a keyboard player with us who'd play sort of like third guitar at some points and. You know, now as a three piece, I can really strip these down to like the essence of the songs and have had really good reactions from fans. So I'm I'm satisfied with it. The fans seem to be satisfied with it. But it's also one of those things that I I said when we started this process that I don't want to re I don't want to sort of relive that. I want to I want to celebrate what it was, but I have no desire to dye my hair. I have no desire to be 27 ever again. I have no desire for any of that stuff. So it has to be celebrating it now, um, not trying to recreate anything. So it's not, I don't, I'm not a big stickler for like, you know, original members or five piece has to tour so that you can hear that one keyboard blip. Like, I don't care about that shit. To me, it's about the emotion and, and being honest and sort of transparent with, with how we feel and how we're playing. And, and that's, that's all intact. I got to tell you all I got you here too, mate. I'm pretty sure I saw you one year after the big day out. I'm pretty sure it might have been around 2002, but we had like a massive three days and we were fucked. And you did your own sideshow in Brisbane at a place called the Roxy the night after. And we were up and up whether we should go or not because we were that fucked, but we did anyway. And your show was, it was that electric, mate, and that, that brilliant that all five of us, like we walked out of there as if we, you know, had 24 hours sleep. Like we were fucked walking in, but we came out feeling great, right? Like, yeah. Your, your live set is insanely brilliant, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. I hope that I hope that we get to do that feeling again for you. <laughs> well, I'm a bit older now, so I'm easy to please. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so the album White Up Scars came out after you just after your work without the drive-in, mate. Like, was it an easier or hard album for you to write at that stage of your career? Like, were you, did you want to just move on quickly, or was it sort of hard letting go a bit at that stage? Um. I think that we didn't even stop to think about it. I think there was definitely a chip on the shoulder that said, oh, we're the, 
we're the three less recognizable members. So we better do this fast and make it as good as we can. And, you know, I've been writing songs since I was 12. So for me, I write all the time, regardless of a, if I'm making a record or not. So I think there was definitely like a chip on the shoulder for sure. Um, there was definitely a feeling like we had a point to prove. And I don't, I don't think that it necessarily overshadowed the music, but it's definitely present in it. Um, making the record with Jerry Finn was probably the greatest thing that we, we, the best decision we made because he was able to take sort of that, that energy and that sort of just grit, the pure grit that we had at that age and really channel it into the record and creativity instead of just doing ourselves in or, or talking shit. Like I've made a point to never talk shit in the press about anybody. Yeah. Um, I've stuck to that for 25 years and I feel like it's a good way to live. Um, but I definitely was putting all of that energy into, into making something. And also at the same time, learning how to be a singer, learning how to be a front man. It's a, it's a different job. It's not something that I was, um, uh, had been doing before, you know what I mean? I was a side man. I love being a side man. So, uh, it was a different gig and, I kind of, you know, secretly, I kind of hope I get to go back to be a sideman at some point because it is like my favorite job. <laughs> that sort of leads me into the next question perfectly, mate. Like I was going to ask you about that because it was your first album as frontman after having been a backup vocalist without the driving. Like, how was the transition there? Like, did you did you go to classes? Did you watch other people? Did you like how how did you make that transition? Uh, I think I just kind of faked it until I made it. You know? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. I didn't have a lot of. You know, it, it's it felt natural enough. I would say before at the drive and I was in a band in high school where I was the singer um and played maybe 30 shows. So I had some experience as as that person. Um, but obviously not on that level. So, you know, going to Big Day Out in two th I think it was whenever 2003, um playing to, you know, tens of thousands of people sort of looking to your left and seeing your giant face on a screen like all that stuff is is not my comfort zone for sure I'm not a big um uh, you know I'm a social person but I don't need all the attention and yeah. so it's a little bit you know it's like a for, for my career it was like a mid-career change it was different it was just different and you know I've grown to love it for sure I love I love my job but it was uh it was hard. it was it was tough for sure. So you are celebrating twenty years of that album, mate. Like what 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 is it do you think about it that's made it stand the test of time that it's still good enough to play twenty years later and people are still enjoying it? I think it's just honesty. Yeah. You know, I think that we we made a very honest record. We made a record that we felt um that came from our hearts and from our souls. And I think that if you're making something honest, I think it has a better chance of standing the test of time instead of trying to be something that you're not. And I know a lot of people are good at that, but I'm not. Um, so for me, it was, this is the way I play guitar and this is apparently the way I sing and this is apparently the way I write lyrics. So that's what it's going to be. And, you know, luckily, um, because At The Drive-In never really reached its full potential. No one ever saw the downside of that band. We were very lucky that we got a big record deal right off the bat. People were really supportive and they didn't question me, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because At The Drive-In didn't sell that many records. At The Drive-In didn't play to that many people. It was just like this great possibility, right? And we sort of got to benefit, all of us got to benefit from that and have careers going forward. And, and how many people get to do that? It's It's very rare in this industry that you get two bands you know, it's very rare. Very so the fact that we had it, right? and, and, and been able to make other records and solo records and solo tours and all of that is, is you know, I feel very fortunate. I, I think that I've been um, very fortunate in this career. I, I never call it luck because it's not luck. Um, it's work, but fortunate. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But Sparta went on a bit of a hiatus in 2008 and returned briefly between 2011 and 2013 before you reuniting permanently in 2017. But looking back, mate, like, do you think those, that stop start was was helpful for the band and your music, or do you think it sort of might have held you back a little bit? Um, well, there's two ways to look at it, right? Um, Career-wise, I'm not very good at doing what you're supposed to do to be famous. <laughs> I'm, I'm not built that way. I don't care about that stuff. Um, 
you know, I always say fame and fortune are kind of the negative parts of this job. It's not my favorite part. It's not something that I ever wanted or, or hoped for. And, and I always say like, I've, I've been famous enough. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. You know, um, for me, taking breaks is absolutely essential to my health because I hit a point where I just don't want to do it anymore. It's not fun. And when music's not fun, it's kind of torture because it's, it's one of my favorite things in the world. And when your favorite thing in the world is giving you grief, um, it's kind of bullshit, right? So I just made a point early on that, um, you know, in 2004, I walked away from a tour and took a couple of months off. And that was the first time that I realized I could say no. And that at the end of the day, I'm responsible for me and my family. I'm not responsible for how much money the manager's making. I'm not responsible for how much money the booking agent is making. I don't give a shit if the president of the label has a Ferrari. None of that stuff is important to me. So what's important to me is me and my family and sometimes you lose sight of that and you get caught up in it and you sort of have to to remind yourself or sometimes your wife has to remind you that <laughs> you're, you're, being, you're being an idiot and you need to take care of the things that are important and and all of that stuff's lessons. So I would say if I didn't stop then, then I probably wouldn't be here now. And I don't think that's an exaggeration and I don't mean necessarily dead. I just mean I could be dead. I could be, you know, like far down the alcohol route i could be uh you know just like fucking lost my mind i don't know so i think for me to just take these breaks um and it's it's kind of funny now after 20 years and and sort of me coming and going as as i please um i just started working with a new management company and one of the things that they were intrigued by is the fact that i come and go that's it's now become part of the story and it's not on purpose, but it's kind of worked to my advantage because I don't have, to, I've never put myself in a position where I have to do something. And I hate that word. I hate, I hate when people tell you, you have to do something because you don't, you don't have to do anything. I mean, literally you don't have to breathe, but there's consequences, right? <laughs> you don't have to take the tour that you don't want to take. There might be consequences. We don't have to do it. I hate that. Um, and it's so easy to tell a young band, you got to do this. You have to do this or else you're going to ruin your career. You're going to ruin their career. You're going to fuck up everybody's life. If you don't do it now, it's never going to happen. And I think it's because they know how hard it is um, to get one level up in this gig. It's it's incredibly hard. Um, but at the same time, what you do is you just run people into the ground. Like there's no reason that that people that do what I do for a living should be so depressed that they're killing themselves. There's no reason for that. Um but we put ourselves in these situations where you just can't get out of them. And I was lucky enough that I had a breaking point early on that wasn't so bad that I was able to come out of it. But what I came out with was like, oh, shit, I don't have to do this. Like, I don't fucking care if you make money. You know what I mean? I care about my family, my life. Like, I get to be selfish because I'm the one making this. I'm the one that's making all of this. And I don't have to listen to you. I can. And I choose to most of the time. But I don't have to. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. Do you have any idea how fucking inspirational you are, brother? <laughs> oh, thank you. A great fucking monologue there, mate. Like that should be that should go out to musicians everywhere when they take their first step. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I've well, always I've always tried to put myself in a position where I can be around young bands and be a voice of reason that has nothing to gain from it. Yeah. Because that's the that's the biggest problem in this industry is that you're around people that have to they gain from what they advise you on. Mm. Um and there's no way a manager is ever going to let a band talk to me if if they know what I'm going to say. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. so it's not like I can be a consultant or I could, you know, no one's ever going to recommend that I go and talk to the band. <laughs> I'm going to fuck up their world, you know? <laughs> Honesty is a very underrated commodity in this modern age, my friend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sure. So your most recent album, Believe, came out in 2020, mate. Like, have you written anything new since then? So we had we had a self-titled record that came out in 2021 or 2022. Yeah, that was last year. <laughs> yeah, we had a record that came out last year, um, a Sparta record. And then the year before that, I put out a, a solo record called Daggers um, with my friends Tucker Rule playing drums and Ben Kenny playing bass um, that came out pretty ridiculously awesome. Um, and again, it's just that you get to an age where you get to do what you want and it's so much fun and and technology as much as it's taken income from us because of streaming etc it's also given us the ability to make records in our houses yeah. and that's that's amazing i got to make that record in like three weeks with my friends on email 
that's fucking crazy, you know? <laughs> All right, man. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's people out there listening to this that still don't really know who Sparta is and and what you've done for the music industry, man. So for those people, describe a Sparta show and, and what they can expect if they turn up and see you when you come out here. So I like to just say that we're we're basically a blue collar working band. You know, there's not a lot of pretension. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, we're just we're just a, a humble, hardworking band. And I like to I like to play my ass off. You know what I mean? I like to get I like to get sweaty and and I like to emote and I like to feel. And none of it is pre planned and none of it is fake. So it's kind of just like a good, honest um, rock show. And I, you know, my favorite compliments in the world are are at the end of a night when a when a crew at a club says, "Man, you guys were you were a dream, you were a dream to have." You know, that's that to me is the biggest compliment. When people that do this every day recognize that you're nice people and you work hard and you don't ask for stupid shit and you don't cause problems and um, you do your job and you get out of everybody's way and you're appreciative. And so to me, it's I wouldn't get to do this without the fans. So obviously, they're number one. But I also wouldn't get to do this without the guy that's loading in the PA, without the guy who's mixing, without the guy who's going to sweep up at the end of the night. Like all of those people make my dreams possible and I'm grateful. And I try to remind myself of that. And I try and make a note to to thank everybody that I can, as long as it's, it's an honest thank you. And I'm not just kissing somebody's ass, but if, if it's a good night, I like to, to be appreciative. And um, I think everybody has a better day. Fuck yeah, brother. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Jim. It's been absolutely absolute pleasure speaking to you, mate. I'll um, be front and centre at the Brisbane show, so hopefully I'll catch you home. We can have a beer. Awesome, man. I'll be there. All right, mate. You take care, brother. Keep smiling, mate. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, man. Take care. Pleasure. Bye-bye.